Jai Shurumbai. Jai So good afternoon, everyone, good afternoon. and welcome to good afternoon. And welcome to this uh, this afternoon's session. Um, I am Joseph Yaru, and I am the chair of this afternoon's session. I'm from the University of Ghana, the Regional Institute for Population Studies, where I serve currently as a director. Um, today's event is co-hosted by partners of what we call the Ghana Hub that we are launching this year and is composed of three organizations, IDS, Institute of Development Studies from University of Sussex. Then we have the University for Development Studies in Tamale, Ghana. We have University of Ghana in Accra. And this series of webinars, which already began, and I guess this is the second one, will convene basically leading experts who will share the latest research and ideas on teams that shape development in Ghana and West Africa. Our aim is to bring together the Ghana Hub Partners on a global platform that facilitates knowledge exchange and learning across disciplines and geographies that will contribute towards generating further research agendas and policy recommendations. So the events basically will be suitable for academics, policy makers, and practitioners with an interest in Ghana's developmental trajectory. And today's event will discuss the intersection between pastoralism and climate change in West Africa. As you all know, it is now clear that livestock have a critical role to play in global climate change. And we also know that at the same time, Pastoralism and livestock keeping provides critical livelihood pathways and cultural identities for millions across the West African region. Now, simultaneously, these people are among those seriously affected by climate change. And we are interested in suggesting contemporary policy directions that have wide ranging and diverse environmental, cultural and practical implications for people, animals, and the environment across ecological zones in West Africa. Therefore, in this webinar, we will be addressing these issues with some reference to the specific context of Ghana, but also touching how they play out across the region and the continent. So at this moment, I would um, jump on to um, introduce the speakers. But before that, just some housekeeping. I will first allow the speakers to present, after which we would have a questions and answers session at the end. We employ all of you to type in your questions into the chat, and uh, these will be passed on to the speakers for responses. This, uh, some of the speakers will use PowerPoint, so you will be seeing these as they come on. So our speakers for today, we have the first speaker, Prof. Steve Toner from the University of Ghana. He's a professor of sociology. He joined the University of Ghana way back in 1999, and his research focuses on Fulani pastoralism rural development, inter-ethnic relations, and irregular migration from Ghana to Libya and Europe. Welcome, Prof. Steve Toner. The next is Prof. Gordana Kranjak, and she is a professor of agricultural engineering at the University for Development Studies, Tamale. 
and she has been working over 30 years in development studies. Her main areas include climate change, water, ecosystem management, irrigation, and international education in developing countries. And she currently serves as deputy director for, for what we saw, Center of Excellence in Irrigation, Drainage, and Sustainable Agriculture at UDS, with collaborations with DFID, FAO, World Bank, who gave among others. Our third speaker, Professor Ian Schoons, is a professorial fellow at IDS, University of Sussex, and lead of the Pastress program, Pastoralism, Uncertainty, and Resilience, which is supported by the European Research Council. He is also the co-director of the ESRC Steps Center, and he's the author of a recent paper in the Journal of Peasant Studies entitled Pastoralists and Peasants' Perspectives on Agrarian Change. Welcome, Prof. Ian. Our fourth speaker is Chief Osman bin Ahmed, and he is the Ashanti Regional Chief of the Fulani, the National Vice President of the Fulani, and the member of the government-established Ghana Cattle Ranching Committee. He trained in Amadou Bello University, Zaria, Nigeria, and a CEO of Cattle Innovations Ghana Limited, the private sector. And he has been in the cattle business since childhood and is dedicated to representing the Fulani and livestock rarest interests in Ghana. Welcome, Chief. And our fifth speaker is Dr. Abdullah Abu Bakar. He is a senior research fellow and currently the director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research, University for Development Studies, Tamale. He is a development management specialist focusing on community-based livelihoods, conflicts, climate change, and environmental degradation and rights-based advocacy programs. And he's published extensively on farmer header conflicts and pastoral livelihoods. So welcome all our five speakers. And um, at this moment, without further ado, I would um, invite the first speaker, Prof. Uh, Steve Toner, to present in eight minutes. And I would have my, um, you know, stickers. So this means you complete halt. This means three minutes left. <laughs> so please, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, audience and audience, your speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yaro, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, The Last Frontier. Fulani migration in Ghana or to Ghana. I'll try um, now. What you can see, it's a, a rough idea of the uh, <clears throat> agroecological zones in Ghana. In fact, we should have had a, a broader West Africa cartography, which will indicate the uh, movement also the Sahelian countries. For today's presentation, I take a historical perspective. And my argument is that the full bay or full any migration to Ghana from the Sahelian region to the Sudan Savannah region. It's almost a, a century. And then moves to the Guinea Savannah, then the transitional zone, the, uh, the forests, they are mostly avoid, of course, the, 
the coastal savanna. Next slide, please. I argue that uh, initially the concentration of uh, Fulani pastoralists was in the extreme north, the southern Sudan. The northern Sudan uh, or the Sudan Savannah region. With Boku, Nandom, and to a lesser extent, uh, we're not really in Avrungu. Boku and Nandom being the, and the Fulani have been engaged in uh, moving from the Sahelian countries of Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, as we all know. In the 40s, they descended onto the Guinea Savannah region. And these are represented by research done in Sola, Wungu, Hindi, Kushegu, by these authors. And uh, I recall that uh, during the 60s, our research indicated that uh, the Fulani had uh, moved into the uh, transition zone between the savanna and the forest region. Confirmed by research done in Nkransa, Yiji, Kintampo North. Of course, the Afra, Afra, Accra Plains, the Full Bay or the Fulani have been there since the 1930s. Since the 1930s. And then uh, in the uh, Afra Plains since the 1990s and the whole Plains since the 2000s. My main argument is that uh, as a result of recurrent drought since the late 60s and 70s, and more recently, what we ref refer to as uh, climate change, climate variability, one of the main strategies of the pastoral Fulani has been, of course, migration and mobility. Now I argue that now that they have gotten to the coast, Accra Plains and the whole Plains, they are under pressure from developments in the Accra Plains in terms of a uh, infrastructure, housing. So they are compelled to move up. They have nowhere else to go. So the main point I want to make is the full and in now have to, they have no other choice in terms of moving further and further and further. So migration is becoming increasingly not a, an option open to them. They would always be uh, mobile. They have always been uh, mobile people. Now, the main approach, what we have to look at is the impact on uh, the main response to uh, increasing drought desertification is uh, mobility. And this has uh, consequences, of course, for their neighbors. I saw the uh, yellow card, does that mean my time is up? So, okay. Thanks, uh, Prof. Yaru. You have two minutes. I have two minutes, then I could go on. So my, um, besides migration, mobility has always been uh, 
the main pastoral uh, strategy to deal with uh, either drought, climate or weather variability, ability to move the heads quickly to pasture or to sources of uh, water. Now the, the last frontier in my argument is the whole place and the Afran place. And the contest there has become very virulent. So it's not surprising that these two regions of Ghana have become the focus of intense pastoralist farmers, both commercial and the peasant farmers uh, contest for land, for water in Ghana. And I think uh, this dynamics is replicated, of course, across all the, the coastal countries in West Africa, be it uh, Cote d'Ivoire or Togo, Benin, and uh, even in Nigeria, where the uh, conflicts in the South has become so intense. So this will call for, of course, uh, different approaches than what the Fulani or the pastoral Fulani have used since the, uh, if you like, the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Tona. And uh, we will move on to the second speaker. That is Professor Godana. Prof. Godana, you have eight minutes and welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, thank Professor Tuna for this very good introduction. I would like to take you aside uh, problems of Fulani is very well described by previous speaker to other dimensions of a problem. So I'll talk a little bit about hydrological cycle and some effects that we expect and what is going on in Northern Ghana. Please, next slide. Uh, we already have evidence in Ghana and specifically in Northern Ghana that climate is changing. Especially we do have evidence in the recent periods that temperature is rising and uh, we have uh, some information which is uh, telling us that about 0.2 degrees Celsius is a rise per decade. But in Northern Ghana, where uh, Fulani is uh, coming to, to Ghana, it is even higher. Next slide, please. Uh, climate change not only rises temperature, but it is also affecting the rainy season itself. The rains are not starting as they were expected to start. The torrential rains are increasing in numbers. Extreme temperatures, we have already seen them. And because of that, we have a lot of flooding and problems with the runoff in Northern Ghana. That will, of course, affect pastoralists as well as other uh, users of the water resources. Next slide. We have already evidence in Ghana for both floods and droughts. In 1970s and 80s, we had three serious droughts and uh, especially Northern Ghana was severely affected. That affects the grasslands for Fulanis as well as agricultural areas and every, every user. But in last 20 years in particular, we have also experienced in 20 years about 19 significant floods, major one being in 2017, just recently. Next slide. We also try to predict what will happen in West Africa with the weather and what will happen in Ghana in, as a result of climate change. But at present, we have different models and we don't have the consensus yet. However, we have 
some indications that increase in extreme rainfall is going to happen in northern Ghana. That means that violent storms will occur more regularly and they will be even uh, more aggressive than before. But we also have an indication that annual rainfall will decline. Uh, decline is projected to be about 1.1 percent by 2020, but by 2080 we have an expected reduction in almost about 21 percent of rainfall. Next slide, please. This is uh, how the climate change and hydrological situation looks like. When we now throw in this mix, um, those uh, all of us living in northern Ghana, the picture becomes even more interesting because there are various players. Climate change will directly affect water avail availability to both humans and to animals, including livestock, of course. And it is in northern Ghana that significant portion of country's li livestock is actually situated. And it is northern Ghana that is primary recipient of Fulani herdsmen, as we heard earlier. Every dry season, and um, some of them are resident, some of them are going back seasonally. There is a large number of such people. Next slide, please. But that sensitive balance that we have uh, is going to be even more impacted because apart from humans, apart from livestock, we also have a major pathway of elephants coming from Burkina Faso in the dry season to more humid areas of Northern Ghana. And they are also competing for uh, fodder and for water with livestock as well as with crop farmers. This season alone, we had about 200 elephants head coming to northern Ghana. I don't know if other speakers are aware. And some of them are now uh, staying permanently, just like how we have livestock and Fulani staying permanently. We equally have wildlife coming virtually for what we call greener pastures. I've seen yellow light, yellow uh, card. Thank you. Next slide. In addition to all these animals, farmers, wildlife users, we also are currently engaged in Ghana by constructing major hydropower dam in northern Ghana at White Water River, which is called Palgu Multipurpose Dam. And it is intended to be a dam which will save northern Ghana from annual floods, produce hydropower, and also provide about 25,000 of irrigated lands. It's a very big scheme. And all these conflicting interests will be coupled with the climate change, and then they will definitely alter hydrology of northern Ghana. So we expect that apart from projected changes, we will also have different alterations by uh, humans as well as climate change af affecting the hydrology of Northern Ghana and of, of course affecting pastoralists as well as crop farmers. I think this is the last slide, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Godana, for the insights into the hydrological cycle and climate change and our pastoralists. So at this moment, I would invite Prof. Ian Schoons to present. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so I'm asking a question, zooming out a bit uh, to the global situation, asking this question, are livestock always bad for the planet? 
the short answer to my um, question is no. Um, and I also ask another question, which is, uh, does this matter? Um, and the answer to that is uh, resounding yes. So why is this significant? There's a wider debate globally that livestock are currently one of the major causes of climate change and that globally we need to shift dramatically diets and production systems away from livestock and animal source foods. And this is promoted by a variety of scientists and think tanks and NGOs and famous people of different sorts. And we see a lot of talk about the scale of livestock emissions and the role that livestock play in this. We even have headlines like the following from The Guardian, avoiding meat and dairy is simply the biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth. But what does this broader global narrative mean for pastoralists? Pastoralists in Ghana and pastoralists around the world. A lot of this debate comes from a set of scientific analyses that emerge and give these big statistics that derive these, uh, drive these narratives. These analyses, analyses come in particular from so-called life cycle assessments, which measure the inputs and outputs and impacts of global, uh, on global warming from a variety of greenhouse gases. And the aggregate figures suggest maybe that 14.5% of total uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock. And this narrative then is supported by a variety of assessments that say huge amounts, perhaps the majority of farmland is used for livestock, but it's producing rather little of our food. So this global narrative about the negative effects of livestock is gaining purchase in wider debates. But how does it play out in pastoral areas? These are some pictures from our sites in the Pastures program from Tunisia, from India, from Sardinia and Italy and from Kenya. And pastoralism is a vitally important livelihood source and source of markets uh, and, and food for a number of people, particularly in marginal areas, including as we've heard in Ghana. But this broader global narrative is affecting the way people are thinking about pastoral development the world over. But if we probe into these analyses, these big life cycle analyses that produce these, uh, these, uh, these narratives, we see there are some problems there. We've done a detailed analysis that will come out in a, in a report later in the year, and we identify a number of gaps and assumptions and biases that uh, these narratives are based on. There are sets of problems around the data, biases in the data. Most of the data that produces these figures comes from northern industrial systems, not from pastoral systems. They use default emission factors and greenhouse gas measures that may not be appropriate for pastoral systems. They tend to conceptualize systems in a particular way around a particular form of efficiency and don't necessarily take account of the complexity of the carbon cycle in pastoral areas, nor their spatial and temporal dynamics, and indeed not the wider ecosystem services that are offered from pastoral systems in extensive rangelands where livestock production is mobile. And they very often assume a set of baselines and alternatives that aren't appropriate in pastoral systems. Alternative land uses are assumed in places where cropping or alternative other uses are just not possible. And if you remove livestock, for instance, these yaks in grazing in a rangeland in uh, Tibet, what will replace them? Well, it won't necessarily be, be a zero carbon uh, alternative. Other ungulates, other uh, herbivores, termites, for example, will replace them equally producing methane and other greenhouse gases. And if we're asked to shift diets, what's the consequence of that for people who rely on meat and milk? Uh, particularly poorer, in poorer and marginalized settings. So we see some big problems with these wider global analyses. But if we focus in on a pastoral landscape, we can get a much better idea of how a carbon cycle works.
This is an example from a Fulani area in, in northern Senegal, done by colleagues at CIRAD. And that particular study showed that in a mobile extensive system, such as this pastoral system, with a detailed wider analysis of the carbon inputs and outputs of that system, that the, the system was in carbon balance. It wasn't affecting the climate in the way that was often assumed. In fact, in some, in, in some uh, seasons, it was actually negative. So if we think about pastoral, pastoral settings, we need to get a bit more disaggregated and a bit more nuanced about how we understand um, uh, climate change emission impacts and think about mitigation in a different way. And by putting pastoralists and pastoral systems at the center, we have to shift our focus to the production process. Industrial versus ex extensive production are very different in their climate impacts. It's not the product, meat and milk, it's how those products are produced. As I've said already, we have to think about the, 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 the assumptions in global assessments and adopt a more integrated approach. And we have to avoid these quick fix solutions that we often hear about, cultured meat, rewilding of rangelands and simplistic diet recommendations that we often see. And most importantly, we need to bring pastoralists back into the global conversation on climate and food systems very urgently. So to conclude, why is this important? Well, it's really important because a number of processes this year, the COP um, in Glasgow in November, the UN Food Systems Summit in New York in, in September, and the ongoing work of the IPCC are all thinking about the impacts of livestock and land use change on climate. But virtually none of these discussions to date have pastoralists or data from pastoral systems at the center. And this urgently needs to change lest the recommendations that come out of this distort policies against pastoralists creating forms of injustice. I'll finish there before Joseph gives me the red card. And if you wanna find out any more, you can look at our website on uh, on on past about pastures. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian, for the global picture and for a seeming defense for the poor pastoralists in developing countries. I will now invite uh, Chief Osman Ahmed to take the floor. Chief Osman, uh, you are muted. C kindly unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. My name is Osman Ben Ahmed. I'm the regional chief of Fulani in Ashanti and then the vice president of all the Fulani chiefs. And actually, the issue of nomadic Fulani, as, I, as you people may recognize that in Ghana, we have three types of our brothers are the full and we have the migrated ones, we have the settlers, and then we have the citizens like us, whose forefathers have been in Ghana for a long, long, long time. Good. Earlier on, we didn't have the problem of these full in terms of conflict and other searching for pastures and all this, but the climatic conditions have brought them down to Ghana because of the rich resources that we have here together with the problems, problems like conflict between the headers and then the, the crop farmers, entering people's farms and doing all sorts of things which are not good. So therefore, we, the leaders, also have to come up with the programs. And some of the programs that we did was trying to centralize them to live in peace with each and everyone. And secondly, we were all, we also taught about the ranching system, which is the best way to tackle this problem. And through our negotiations with the government, that is the Minister of Agriculture and then the National Security, the Wawasi site in Eastern region was set up. That is to make them move their cattle there so that they will start knowing what we mean by the ranching system. In order to allow your, your animals to be moving here around, better we confine them so that the grasses are grown to be fed and to feed the animals. 
And then we are also trying to come up with other issues like trying to market the, the their animals, which are which takes a lot of organic food instead of the de organic as they have in Europe and America. So we are trying to get them more investors to come and invest into that sector, a sector of where we can confine the animals in one place for them to not to create problem, to produce milk, which should be turned hygienically, uh, hygienically into usage, and then to be process the meat into organic. Because when we do that, this kind of conflict that we have between the, the cattle headers and then the crop farmers with this related problem of using unapproved transhuman. So we are coming up with systems, system which the government is doing everything possible, training of them, trying to get their children to go to school. I'm referring to those school learners who are settling. Because the nomadic ones, it's difficult for us to control their movement, but we not even know where they came from, how did they enter the country, which where are they going and all those things. But one thing we know for sure, places like Ashanti region, and some three, the three North Europeans are very ideal for all these things. As you, the learned ones, know much more than me. So the system is that we are trying to bring in more reforms, more innovations, and then trying to get investors to come and invest. If we do that, there won't be all this need. I'm sure I will not even take most of the eight minutes given and the to me because ours is just to make sure that they, they will take a environment where they, they live and they work effectively and then we using the conflict to turn it into benefit to benefit the country to use the meat and export. I think so these are some of the issues and then the program that we are trying to take in place. So I will not use most of the eight minutes because uh, I have not started going by PowerPoint presentation. So I'm just telling you currently what we are trying to do unless there are certain questions that people want to ask that I can talk about. Yes, Mr. Chris. Yes, thank you very much, Chief. Um, I mean, this is great to hear of the different perspectives of Fulani's sedentarization, the um, idea of, about uh, the probably the seeming death of nomadism with the introduction of westernized uh, systems of ranching. And uh, so I guess, I mean, we would have some more time to discuss this. So I will now invite uh, Dr. Abubakar to um, make your presentation. Dr. Abubakar, the floor is yours. Are you muted? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I I have to cut down a lot of my slides because I thought uh, there would be enough time for me to. So I, I'll just go straight to the discussion and the issues uh, and the implications issue. Uh, pastoralism and climate change in Ghana. That is the topic that uh, we're going to discuss and. Uh, 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 previous uh, speakers, some of them have established uh, the movements of uh, uh, pastoralists from the Sahelian to Ghana and then some other places in West Africa. Um, the studies, uh, if you look at uh, the relationship between pastoralism and climate change, uh, especially in Africa, you will notice that uh, places where pastoralism dominates. Uh, those places are also associated with uh, environmental degradation, high temperature, and then uh, sometimes uh, uh, floodings and also droughts, long droughts and what have you. This uh, points to the fact that uh, there should be some relationship between climate change and pastoralism. Uh, the social sciences point of view is what, where I am coming from. Uh, in the Savannah zone, Pastoralism is practiced in several, uh, uh, I mean, it's practiced for several decades. Livestock, especially cattle, are part of uh, the social, cultural, as uh, 
some of the speakers already uh, alluded to, and that shows the importance of uh, this discussion. So uh, in Northern Ghana, for instance, uh, it's even part of some of our cultural practices, uh, payment of dairy and what have you. And uh, uh, this shows how important the uh, cattle are and how uh, almost everybody, especially in the Upper East region, almost every household uh, was keeping a cattle for some of these purposes. And uh, as a result of that uh, overgrazing and then uh, uh, also destruction of the environment occurred as a result. The destruction of pastoral infrastructure in the savanna also was leading to insufficient pasture and also uh, the pursuance of the range line uh, 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 concept for grazing uh, also compel uh, pastoralists in, uh, in the neighboring countries to move to Ghana. And when the Northern Ghana, the uh, pastures, I mean, the um, pastures were also drying up, uh, this movement continued to the forest and then the coastal zone. So in the, uh, in the forest zone, for instance, uh, uh, pastoralism in Kesin, I mean, began around 2000, where pastoralism, uh, uh, pastoralists uh, began to move into uh, these areas uh, in search for more range land. As a result of uh, uh, the pastures in northern Ghana was getting dry up, and then the pressure also from uh, the nomadics coming from uh, the neighboring countries. Uh, in the coastal zone, to uh, this uh, pastoralism also started long ago. Uh, and this uh, has its roots uh, in the early uh, independence days uh, when the cattle were being moved uh, from northern Ghana and then the neighboring countries for a craft for sale. Those excess cattle, which were not sold, uh, were also uh, sent to neighboring Accra uh, suburbs for rearing and then for fattening for sale. And this uh, also led to uh, pastoralism activities springing up uh, in the coastal uh, areas. And uh, as a result, overgrazing and then uh, cutting down of uh, shrubs and trees for animals to uh, consume also uh, led to the destruction of uh, the coast. I mean, the coastal, uh, uh, the coastal uh, zone. Uh, so, if you look at uh, this uh, uh, movement, uh, you will notice that pastoralism actually has an effect on the environment. Uh, due to overgrazing pollution of the water bodies, which easily dries up. The impact of this is that uh, overgrazing due to a, a, a range land uh, concept is now one of the issues that also contribute to climate change. And then destruction of vegetation cover, forest reserves, secret groups, and what have you, as a result of increasing number of cattle as against uh, the pastures uh, infrastructure, which are not... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, enough. Uh, most of the instances, uh, this cattle rely heavily on these natural resources, which also regenerate maybe from time to time. And the cattle even uh, start consuming this grass even before they get uh, uh, two weeks old after uh, germination. And this is killing the, I mean, the, uh, the, the, uh, the grasses even as young as uh, they, they grow. So heading of the crops, uh, I mean, uh, 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 is, I mean, hardening of the soil uh, research also indicates that uh, overgrazing and where animals are also dominant, uh, the stepping on the ground and what have you, harden the top soil. And then also sometimes the animal's foods also kill the microorganisms such as ants, earthworms, that contribute to loosening the soil for easy penetration of uh, uh, water and then uh, uh, water, air, and nutrients. So where animals are overgrazing, the land becomes barren and uh, find it difficult to regenerate as a result of this. Pastoral activities also lead to erosions. And most of the time, the hoofs of the cattle uh, trampling on the air for a long time uh, also creates uh, erosions. When it rains, the water carries out the loose soil and then expose the land and therefore making it difficult for the plants to regenerate. And then in some instances, the pastorals themselves are uh, accused of even burning bushes uh, for uh, uh, animals to pave way for them to get to uh, uh, other areas where they can graze. And this also contributes to environmental degradation and climate change issues. And then of course, uh, cutting down of trees also uh, leads to depletion of the environment 
and also destruction of the vegetation cover that can also lead to climate change issues. Pollution of water bodies and then a, 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 therefore quickening up the drying up of ponds where cattle uh, uh, use. Uh, it is also discussed that, I mean, discovered that uh, uh, cattle normally use small ponds, especially when the water is drying up. They get into the ponds and then they add up the whole water and that quickens the drying up of these ponds and also uh, leading to uh, some environmental uh, uh, problems. The impact of climate change on pastoralism is also uh, noticed. Uh, prolonged dry season, heavy concentration of rains and high temperatures uh, also affect uh, uh, animals. Uh, this uh, increased uh, transhumanism as pastoralists, uh, I mean, survival strategy in search for uh, uh, pastures and water. So as a result of high temperature and then uh, grasslands are drying up and all what have you, uh, this uh, also leads to transhumanism that also affects the cattle. This also increases violent conflicts between farmers and pastoralists as they move to new areas or new lands where they previously do not know or they don't know the terrain very well. And uh, as a result of climate change, they are forced to move into new range lands where they encounter a lot of uh, challenges. And also this uh, leads to also loss of uh, weight and market value of animals because the animals keep on roaming for several hours and several weeks in search of uh, uh, pasture and water. And uh, as a result, they lose their weight and market value and then uh, finding, making it difficult for pastoral economy to survive. High temperatures or excessive rains are also not good for, for the health of the livestock. Was a contraction of diseases by animals, high mobility and mortality of livestock are also recorded as a result of uh, the movement of cattle from long distances uh, to in search of water and also pastures. The combined effects of this uh, make pastoralism vulnerable and also unproductive and unattractive is as a base uh, the poverty of pastoralists uh, as a result of this uh, climate change. The implication for livestock subsector in Ghana could be that a high cost of uh, producing livestock may lead to a uh, high cost of dairy, I mean, a uh, high cost of dairy and then beef products because of uh, the increasing uh, uh, cost of production. Also, increase in the importance of uh, inorganic, uh, I mean, sorry, increase in the importation of inorganic chicken and fish uh, products to replace the high cost of beef and uh, 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 beef and uh, uh, dairy products. And then also reduction of livestock population. Uh, temperatures, uh, I mean, the climate change is actually affecting the production of, uh, I mean, uh, 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 livestock. And this also has implication for uh, meat and then the uh, dairy. It also leads to collapsing of pastoral livelihoods. Uh, most of the instances, the conflicts and also the struggle from uh, herding cattle from one point to the, uh, the other is making it very difficult for most pastorals to continue in the businesses. Some of them are leaving the pastoral uh, industry and then try to find some other livelihoods in town because pastoralism is now becoming very uh, dangerous and also very difficult as a result of uh, the uh, climate change conflicts and all those uh, issues that we, uh, I mean, enumerated around, I mean, above. So alternative level means for pastoral families are springing up. Some of them are now becoming sedentary just to avoid uh, the hustling and bustling, uh, I mean, associated with the pastoral, I mean, pastoralism uh, in, in Ghana. So uh, if you look at uh, that, it also has, uh, I mean, low contribution. Pastoralism in Ghana is now, uh, I mean, livestock is becoming uh, increasingly smaller and they are contributing to uh, the domestic, I mean, gross domestic product is also uh, reducing uh, lower. So now if you talk about COVID-19 implication, uh, since the COVID uh, started, uh, this issue of, uh, uh, this uh, led to the closure of the borders and that, that also reduced uh, the influx of uh, nomadics from uh, uh, the neighboring countries, even though most of them don't use official uh, Entry points, they use uh, some other means to get into the country. But since the outbreak of COVID, uh, there have been a reduction in the movement of uh, pastoralists from the neighboring countries. Perhaps uh, the security is checking the borders 
and also uh, trying to ensure that uh, movement across uh, unapproved uh, rules are not also uh, allowed. So in the, I mean, the past uh, a year or so, uh, there have been a reduced uh, number of clashes uh, between the uh, farmers and herders. And most of the times these clashes are uh, generated by those who are coming from uh, the new, the nomads who don't know the terrain and normally lead the cattle into others' farms and then causing the, uh, the destruction of crops and leading to clashes. So COVID also, I mean, uh, as a result of the COVID, there's also been a reduced, uh, uh, I mean, the increased cost of livestock. Uh, perhaps uh, maybe those who used to migrate with their cattle to Ghana, sometimes they also sell the cattle to, I mean, uh, keep on living to survive on the sales of the, uh, the, the, the cattle. So as a result of maybe this uh, movement, uh, the uh, uh, cattle, I mean, there have been a reduction uh, in the number of cattle for sale, and that has also affected the cost of uh, livestock uh, products. It also affected pastoral economy uh, variously because of the movement. Uh, some of them also are not able to uh, uh, sell the animals to be able to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, by uh, some of the things that they will require for this. So how to mitigate uh, this is, uh, as uh, Osman uh, indicated. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, Dr. Bukari. Hello. I think, yes. yes. We have overshot your time by more than five minutes. So uh, and I think that the question oh. I was going to ask you, you've already answered it. So thank you very much. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll continue from this point. So thanks very much, Dr. Abkari. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is an eye opener on what is happening in Ghana, really, from the perspective of Northern Ghana. So, um, at this moment, the question I was going to ask you, you've already answered it in your last slide, which was about COVID 19. So, I would want to hear the perspective of uh, Prof. Tona. Do you expect COVID 19 would have any impacts or implications for trends you have described in your presentation, the, your, your historical outline of? Uh, how the Fulanese have been moving. Um, Dr. Abdullah has already hinted on what is happening currently. From your perspective, what do you think would hap is happening and will happen? Prof. Totona. Okay, uh, thank you very much. The last speaker has already mentioned some of the, the effects. Now, the COVID has led to a reduction in movements across the borders, not of the pastoralists and the uh, their cattle, since they use unofficial bodies, but of their family members. Normally, they are the wives and the young ones join them and they typically go through formal border crossing areas. And they have not had that, the point. But the, uh, the other issue has to do with uh, access to markets as a result of restrictions in movements. Of course, pastoralists themselves rely heavily on markets, almost weekly. They go to markets to procure grain, food items, and other household uh, live items for household activities. Well, and this was a, a bit uh, difficult at the initial stages particularly during the lockdown. But of course, this has since uh, been, uh, the impact has since lessened. Uh, the COVID has also had effect, of course, on offtake of livestock in terms of uh, depressing the market in the towns where the Fulani sell their animals. So it meant that they have to uh, keep the animals for longer period on the hoof and wait for better times. 
in the last months, the market for livestock has picked up and uh, things are better. Now, um, finally, what I gathered has to do with, the, as I explained, mobility, if not migration, is uh, fundamental to pastoralism. And uh, COVID did affect long distance movements of livestock. They had to keep the stock within shorter distances and then uh, relocating to dry season grazing areas. And some of these typical pastoral strategies was not as effective as it used to be regularly. But as I indicated, since the beginning of the year, things are beginning to improve. Thank you very much. So these are the areas that I could uh, identify, the impact of uh, COVID. Yes, thank you very much to both um, Prof. Tona and uh, Dr. Abdullahi. Um, I now want to find out from uh, Prof. Godana uh, and Chief Osman and Ian. Um, I mean, what do you find to be the most important research gaps in relation to issues, climate change and pastoralism in West Africa? What should we be researching into? What is needed? What knowledge do we need to know in order to help with the policy formulation? Prof. Godana. Yes, thank you very much. I have also hinted um, to this in my presentation. To me, the nexus between the development of the country, industrialization, intensification, and then the life as we know of pastoralists is not investigated at all. If you add to this a mix of climate change and various other factors that, um, that are rapidly changing, we can say that it is no more as we know it. Rapid changes are taking place, situation is altering, and we don't really know where, the, where it is leading. And that is uh, due to the joint pressure one, from intensification because of the population pressure. Uh, Dr. Abdullah also mentioned the degradation and then two, also from climate change. So we are in situation where many stakeholders are all claiming the same resource. And then we are not really trying to objectively provide the uh, a solution on how to best utilize limited resources. Thank you. Thank you. So Chief, Chief Osman, so what is your take on this? I mean, Chief, you did outline some strategies that you and government and public donors have worked on in terms of um, uh, reducing um, uh, the strain of animals into uh, peasant farms through um, uh, sedentarization, keeping you know, uh, animals in one place and growing uh, uh, pasture. I mean, what, what, I mean what, what challenges do you, are people facing or do you envisage that needs to be addressed? Uh, Chief, you are, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Is it clear now? Yes, please. Good. For us as a threat, the number one problem that we are facing is about the peace. To every Fulani or to every livestock owner, what he wishes most is where he can get feed for his animals, that's feed and water. So our number one thing that we want to be with the, our dear learners to put to, to research on is how can we get feed throughout the year? Secondly, introduction of modern animal house boundaries. So that we, our people will start learning that they don't need to allow the animals to move everywhere. They need to station them, grow their grass, and feed them. Secondly, the Uh, 
uh, Chief, your your network is um, is gone off now. You are frozen. If Osman, can you hear us? Okay, I guess we will um, get back to him when he returns. We'll try to get him on phone. So, uh, Ian, can you? Thanks, Joseph. I mean, there are so many questions being raised by these presentations. Um, you asked for one. So if climate change is going to generate more variability in the system around feed, around markets, around rainfall and so on, hydrology and so on, and with this more uncertainty, then we have a question. What is the best way of managing and responding to increasing variability under climate change? Is it facilitating mobility, negotiating conflict, and managing pastoralism, uh, you know, making use of the best of pastoral practices from pastoralist own knowledge? Or is it, as uh, Chief Osman has been suggesting, uh, settlement, modernization, moving to a ranching system? Now, I don't know the exact answer to that, and I'm sure there will be variations uh, in different settings. But my hypothesis would be that actually elements of pastoralist systems that make use of variability and respond to uncertainty gives first greater opportunities for more people, increasingly diversifies markets, not allowing them to be captured by a narrow group, reduces environmental degradation because of facilitating mobility and not putting people all in one place, and provides opportunities for uh, greenhouse gas emissions because mobile systems on extent in extensive grazing uh, can do that more than others. And I think this is a massively important research agenda because too often we revert to colonial understandings of settlement and modernization that have been tried before and have failed before, uh, rather than thinking innovatively uh, with pastoralists and pastoralists' own knowledge uh, about how to respond to climate change. Thanks, Ian. Yes, and I guess also, I mean, you've hit on the other aspect of um, we continuing some old narratives that probably needs to be re, um, reinvestigated, right? Old narratives such as the pastoralists are destroying, you know, um, old narratives around the uh, conflicts between herds and farmers without uh, looking at currently what are the new constraints that make, I mean, that bring about this. We had, uh, I mean, herders and peasants living peacefully in the past. So why now? So probably we need to find out why now? What, I mean, I mean, what, why is the context, you know, producing these problems? And, um, and of course, also the whole idea about there is a need to have livestock if we want to have our organic agriculture, if we want to also have some improved soil conditions. So it might not always be the case that the livestock are causing soil erosion and destroying soil structures and what have you. So we need to also understand uh, these in context. And I guess uh, what Chief Osman was saying is, it's all also about management. How are we managing the two groups of people? How is space being managed to make sure that uh, the, the school existence. So I will, um, there are some questions here, some comments first. Let me just um, read out some comments. Unfortunately, um, uh, Mr. Haruna, we are not able to uh, link you to voice. So if you can um, type your question, that would be wonderful. So that I can read both your questions and your comments. So we have, um, uh, some comments that uh, pastoralists from the Sahel go to many coastal countries. This is good. It's a good thing for uh, uh, exchange. Um, if we go in strict compliance with regional laws such as ECOWAS, ADEC decisions, I think free movement is essential in the ECOWAS region, and that only has advantages. Thank you. So, I mean, we have to continue to allow pastoralists move, you know, probably even without documentation but then in a controlled manner. Then we have Omotu Yole Ambali. I think the farmer header conflict should not be allowed to continue. 
So it's a problem that requires holistic and pragmatic approach. One of the best ways to tackle this problem is the designation of land for pasture and range. Such reservation areas uh, should be properly regulated by governments with management committees among the headers who should be responsible for coordination and management. And I think this is what Chief Osman uh, spoke about earlier on. And I guess this is a much bigger problem in Nigeria than even Ghana. Probably some lessons can be learned from other African countries. Um, and he cites examples, uh, government grazing reservation area to be located across areas dominated by headers. This should be well regulated with little taxation for the management. Management committee should be well constituted, right? So all these are solutions. I, I guess this, the speakers can reflect on these uh, strategies that are coming out. And we have Haruna is talking about um, this transhumans is in search of resources which are often scarce in certain areas and provide proximity advantages such as milk, meat, and fertilization of fields. And I think this is, I don't know, this is very important because really it's an advantage to have a Fulani with 100 cattle on your farm rather than a disadvantage. It, it's also an advantage to the local economy as in terms of availability of meat and milk. So the, 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 the problem then becomes how do we ensure that um, um, we do not probably have more than 1,000 or 2,000 cattle in one location at the same time as Ian said. So um, probably you want to react to this before I continue the next batch. Uh, I will leave this open. So if you want to, you can simply go ahead since we are many, just four of us. You can pick on any of the comments as a question and react to it. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I'll attempt uh... Uh, looking at uh, the regulation uh, from the Ghanaian perspective, uh, you notice that uh, in Ghana, the government does not own the land. And that is where it is difficult for government to acquire large tracts of land to make them reserved for uh, cattle uh, uh, ranching. Um, and also, if you, uh, Chief Osman mentioned the Wawasi uh, Ranch, it was established by the government. And of course, uh, many started using it, but somewhere along the line, uh, most of the, the headers were also trying to avoid the place because they are used to uh, this range land uh, uh, pastures. They are used to moving around with the cattle, wherever they are. So it is difficult to actually get them in one place because they themselves are not used to being confined. And also lands not belonging to government and uh, belonging to uh, individuals, uh, families, and what have you, it becomes very difficult to acquire large tracts of land, especially where those who own the lands may not also own the cattle. I think that is where the challenge is in trying to get uh, ranches and also in trying to uh, uh, control this cattle. And uh, the conflict, as somebody was saying, is uh, as a result of uh, those moving from the Sahelian, from other areas who come in, they don't know the terrain. In some instances, they even graze the animals at night. And then they move into farms and then destroy them, causing uh, troubles for all headers. So I think government needs to come out strongly to maybe we suggested this in some other fora that uh, there should be a strict control of this kind of movement where people should be given, I mean, uh, headers should be given tax, animals should be identified by their owners and what have you. And that kind of thing can also, if they themselves are responsible and identifying alien ones and also maybe reporting to the authority where they will deal with them in terms of trying to let them register and then have places where they can uh, graze their animals. Maybe that can reduce uh, the conflicts. Other than that, the current situation is that uh, getting large tracts of land for grazing may not be feasible because the land owners are not, may not necessarily be cattle owners. And also uh, those coming, they graze without borders. 
Okay, so thank, thank you. you very much. I now have some a direct question to um, uh, Tuna and uh, yeah, and uh, Osman. You've just spoken. There, I mean, someone wants to know how do different groups within pastoral communities? We are talking about men, women, children, youth, older people, people with disabilities, right? How do they experience the impacts of climate change? The differentiated experiences of these people. So, uh, Prof. Tona, you can pick on it. I hope uh, I hope I got the question right. How does the? I mean, we are talking of a pastoral household. First of yes. all, you have to understand that the, it is not one person. It's normally members of the household who are engaged in pastoral livelihood. That is the grandfather, the uh, grandmother, the father, they are living together within a compound. So, and uh, what, uh, and the activities are shared. So women would typically be engaged in uh, milking of livestock and in the selling of milk on the market. And of course, the usual uh, uh, providing uh, food for the uh, household. The young, it is normally the young men or boys in some case under 18 who deal directly with moving cattle. So they take the cattle on a daily or sometimes seasonal basis to distant pastures. And they may come back or sometimes they, they camp there for several months during the dry season, typically along a water source or river bank. So they are variously affected. The elderly or the parents of the young, they are there, they provide more or less management. They manage. They inspect the head when the head is brought back in the evening. Sometimes, of course, they do some counting to make sure all the animals are there. And they also work on the... Uh, they also look on the health of each of the animals. So these are, they play uh, various roles, but it is a, a household affair or extended family affair. So when one part is affected, the other part, uh, if it's because if the young cannot uh, take the animals out, to grace or restricted movements, the entire pastoral system is disturbed. The, the other side, of course, is if they are, uh, in most of Ghana, we hardly have full pastoral systems. What we have largely is agro-pastoral system. Most households, at least, during the during the uh, main season or the rainy season, they do some uh, crop growing around their house, not a big thing, around their compounds. Sometimes they hire or call on their neighbors to assist them with the weeding and some other agricultural activities. Here again, it is largely the work of the youth or the main man of the house who remains in the house while the young ones take the animal. So the pastoral system, I would say, is interlinked, interconnected. If the feeding, for example, is poor, the women have little, uh, they have little milk as we experienced during the 
during the uh, dry season and so on. And therefore milk sales is reduced. So I think we should think more in terms of the household, the pastoral households, rather than individuals yeah. in that sense. Okay. So that yeah. is how I okay. How Okay, thanks very much. So, and also, um, yeah, just before Ian comes in to pick up on some of these questions, as uh, also a scenario I realize in the north, um, in the in the Fumbisi Valley, where you have pastoralists also uh, now picking up on this, uh, uh, becoming agro pastoralists, uh, realizing the benefits of their crowds to um, producing lots of maize and uh, and cowpea as a result of the places that they that they use. And I, and I think this is a new development rather than just I mean, the movement of, um, of, of Fulanis around. Uh, Ian, yes, your response? Well, I wanted to pick up on a couple of the comments in the general chat um, and probe a little bit and raise some questions about the nature of this conflict that you raised earlier, Joseph. I mean, it's very clear that across the Sahel, uh, there, there are increasing conflicts between herders and farmers. But we have to ask in a little bit more detail, I think, that rather than just throwing the old narratives that herders and farmers are always in conflict, about where these conflicts arise and why. Because as has been hinted and is an increasing trend, there's a much more integration between herders and farmers than is often thought about. I mean, the exchange of manure, the exchange of labor, the increasing pattern of agro-pastoralism within farming communities, these are patterns that we see right across the Sahelian belt and show that there are mutual benefits, as a, somebody put it in the chat, as a joint business between livestock farming and agriculture. But the question is, where do these conflicts come from? And I suggest that actually we need to look at a wider political economy going back to the colonial era and the imposition of borders, false borders in a way, across pastoral regions and the growth of uh, large investments in dry land areas that have expropriated huge amounts of land through land grabbing and hydropower developments and so on. These are the processes often facilitated by the state that have resulted in, in, in some of these conflicts. It's not just because pastoralists and herders hate each other. I don't think that's the case. That's a, a narrative that we need to dispute. And of course, it's not surprising because of this, this uh, the way that pastoralists over many years from the colonial era, era on have been neglected by state uh, benefits that, you know, in some Sahelian areas, people are joining up with jihadist uh, uh, groupings um, and 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 providing uh, who are providing a, a sense and a narrative which is is more uh, conducive to them. That's where a bigger geopolitical and religiously based conflict then emerges, which is particularly dangerous. So I think in answer to the question, yes, absolutely, subsidised fertilisers can undermine these forms of interchange and the use of manure that there are alternatives out there that could easily be developed, which would enhance these collaborative arrangements between pastoralists and herders. And at the cross-border level, yes, definitely a wider pastoral compact under ECOWAS or whatever cross-national regime needs to be thought about because pastoralism, pastoralists indeed aren't migrants. They're just people who move across borders. Um, in that sense, they should be seen as transnational contributors to wider economies rather than simply uh, offering a frame that is very national specific. And that's a different political debate uh, that needs to be take place in the region across multiple countries, I think. And in West Africa, that's particularly pertinent, particularly given these wider political and religious conflicts that are emerging in the region. Okay, so thanks, Ian. Um, just so now, let me just summarize a few of the questions and concerns that um, you can pick up um, generally. So we have one that says that when we sedentarize uh, pastoralists, it will benefit some, right, but not everyone, especially coastal Ghana, and um, the things that uh, keep us from inland countries will stand to uh, experience a bunch of these negative effects. 
So therefore, how will this be managed if we start sedentarizing? Then it simply means that people who are supposed to be escaping from the dangers of, um, of climate change from the Sahel, when things are bad in the Sahel, move down, what is going to happen to them? That is one. And then also when it comes to uh, conflicts between farmers and herders, right, it has become a popular media topic in Ghana. Right, with and the issues are about the conflict rather than pastoral issues, which are never discussed. We don't discuss about pastoralism as an important livelihood activity that generates meat and milk and and jobs, but rather we discuss what happens between um, farmers and you know, and and probably I I, I mean just to add, I think uh, as a valid point, we probably have probably thousands of Fulanis. Well, we probably have probably only hundreds of cases of, of conflicts, but this is magnified by the media. And Sergio talks about his uh, mission he was part of to Northern Ghana. And he's seen lots of doses of chemicals being used, herbicides, herbicides, fertilizers. When probably um, a good integration between past Fulanis and farmers could have, you know, uh, probably even save the state of loss of foreign exchange and also the soils of all these chemicals. So, I mean, why? But it, it seems Ghanaian authorities are very in, much interested in attracting uh, the flows of livestock, but at the same time, contradictorily, are uh, not uh, encouraging this uh, cross breeding between the two. I'll stop here for any for comments from, um, uh, yeah. Prof. Godana, would you want to take a bite on any? Uh, you are muted. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I have unmuted and I think I agree with the last uh, comment that a lot of chemicals are being used in Northern Ghana. In fact, uh, current practice is for instance, for example, for young farmers to spray chemical as strong as Roundup, very uh, destructive before they farm yam. Yes, better integration between the pastoralists and then the crop farmers could have many benefits uh, for consumers, but also for both pastoralists and farmers. I think uh, the relationship doesn't need to be uh, um, one of the conflict. It can be one of the mutual benefit and collaboration. I think I agree with that uh, last uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Steve, why is the media so much interested in conflict rather than any other, I mean, issues of how can we help the Fulani if we want to reduce pastoralism to the term Fulani? I know that is wrong, but I think that is what we all know in Ghana and West Africa. When we talk of pastoralism, we think of Fulani. And how can we move beyond that? Well, the media, as they are set up, they are in for sensationalism, isn't it? On the one hand. On the other hand, I mean, we also have to, uh, we also have to uh, admit that uh, Pastoralists have also really not uh, been part and parcel of governance in our country for since independence, we could say. And uh, most of our political, in fact, the educated ones, I wouldn't even limit it to our leaders. Even on the typical uh, university graduate student does not understand the pastoralism or the Fulani. I recall uh, 30 years ago when I uh, started uh, studying the uh, full bay on the Ghana Burkina Faso border. Some colleagues at the University of Ghana asked me, are you not afraid of them? Are you, so that is the, so that feeling that they are dangerous because we don't know them 
we don't understand their culture and some other reasons. And uh, the fact that we feel that they are, they are strangers, in quote unquote, even if we have a third, degree, a third generation Fulani now or fourth in places like Boku and some other places, but they are still not, a, in that sense, integrated or accepted. So they are still seen as outsiders. And I think this is one of the reasons why but things are improving. Over time, things have improving. The Fulani themselves, I think the chief who is with that here is also an example. Now they are well organized. They need more organization. They have to also speak as they have done with respect to the census, for example, the ongoing census, they are alleged marginalization. So full any organizations, they must uh, make their presence felt. They must talk to the media, their leadership, they must uh, come out of their shells. And uh, the media are waiting. I, I have done a few, uh, a few discussions on radio and TV, and you could see the, the depth of uh, knowledge, information. The media also want information. So my appeal is to the various uh, Fulani organizations to, uh, to, to be proactive, to intervene, yeah. to also use the media. And that is, uh, yeah. Things can improve yeah. a bit through that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Now, uh, yes, now there are, there are uh, joint question here from Nkuba, Michael, Mawuto, Alifo. So uh, about um, range land policy in Ghana and also ECOWAS policy. Um, so, I mean, what does the Ghana policy and ECOWAS policy have to say about mobile and sedentary pastoralism, right? And um, and um, I mean, Mauto specifies by saying that pastoralists are not refugees, they are not migrants, right? They cross national frontiers, but they belong to the region as a whole, West Africa, right? So how can this missing gap in international law be addressed? Um, so uh, who will want to pick up on this? Issues of policy, ECOWAS and Ghana policy. Yeah, I, I think that uh, ECOWAS uh, policy is talking about free movement of people and goods. I, and I think that uh, in practice, this is actually going on because uh, there are businesses uh, going across uh, the country. But uh, on the aspect of the cattle movement, uh, I don't know specifically what the law says about that. And I think that uh, maybe ECOWAS will have to revisit that. Because uh, when you talk about free movement of cattle in large scale across boundaries, coming to different territories, then you can imagine what is happening. Uh, in Mali, Niger, and then other uh, West African countries where the rare cattle, they have specific policies for, I mean, a, a grazing. And cattle cannot just go around anywhere and graze. They have designated places for specific cattle for grazing. So even there, they don't just go around and then uh, like, I mean, uh, uh, just go around and uh, looking for uh, graze lands to graze their, I mean, the pastures to graze their land, I mean, to graze their animals. But uh, if you follow that ECOWAS, uh, I mean, uh, protocol on its surface value, you may say that, okay, they are allowed to move anywhere, but uh, when they move in there and they are not able to control these animals, that is where they get into the troubles. And you all are aware of what is happening in Nagogo, a farm plain areas, where that place became a very good conducive uh, place for, uh, I mean, uh, pastorals to move in. And over the years, uh, these classes uh, were occurring here and there. 
So it is the uncontrolled nature of uh, this uh, grazing that uh, brings about uh, uh, this uh, problem. Otherwise, uh, they, they move in well. They will only come in. They will only notice that when there is a problem, when they destroy uh, crops and then the conflict arises, that is when these the issues of Otherwise, they come in. Nobody restricts their movement. And I think that maybe the government will have to revisit that aspect of the law. Okay. So uh, I think uh, uh, Chief came in, uh, you know, after he dropped. So I will give him the last word before I uh, wrap up. Uh, Chief, do you want to say anything? You've been listening to what has been going on. <laughs> I, want to say, I, want, I, I want to talk on the Ghana Cattle Ranching Committee. Can you hear me, please? Yeah. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Go yes, ahead. go ahead. Uh, the, go the, go the Ghana government set up a Ghana Cattle Ranching Committee for which I am a member. And then part of the duty, part of the work that we did was the team went to Togo to look at the transhuman. What do they do if the animals are moving from one place to another, moving from one district to another? What do they do? In fact, there's a project they are working on that. And secondly, we as their leaders, who we are always getting up to let them know there's no need in moving your cattle from one place to another. Just find a way. If you want to get settled, the district that you are, go and register with the district assembly. Let us know where you are located, which people are mining your animals, how many of them. I mean, I'm referring to cattle headed. But one thing that should also surprise you is most of the cattle that you see around Agogo and Co are meant, they are for the citizens. About 40% of those cattle are, are for the citizens. They buy the cattle and give them to the plant to raise. So if there's a problem, even if they are suppressing cow legs, they cannot take the animals anywhere. That's why most of the animals are gunned down. Secondly, there's an economic aspect of it, an exploitation, because most of it, they raise the trouble between them and then the, the Fulani so that they can gun down the cattle and then turn them into what we call here in our local palace as Impuna. That is why if you go to places like Koko and Ko, you see those kind of Impuna things that they are doing. Now they've changed it, not, it's not a bush meat now. They have the, the dead cattle that they kill, and then they turn it into that system that become an economic venture. So we went to Abuja in life. As I remember, uh, this thing is happening everywhere. We went to Abuja on the same thing. The former head of complaint, I was sent there by the United Nations to represent FAO to do that. In fact, you could see that even most of the problems that they have now is now moving down. The nomadic ones, when they are coming, they don't know anybody, they don't know the route, they don't know anything, they are just passing. And then they can do anything, they can kill, they can do anything. So therefore, we as a citizens, because but some, some time ago, this problem was not there. They are coming and brought in all this problem. Ghana did not know anything, but there was a time I was talking to the chief of Abubo, and I was told me that some years back, they, they were with the full needs and they were like brothers and sisters, but because of their influence, all sorts of people have now joined us why we are having this complex. So for us, you are asking as what type of, what are we expecting? We are looking at where we can get feed during the dry season, because if there's a way where we can get feed to feed our animals, there won't be any problem. And then the issue of the human route, where do they normally pass? That has to be well identified. I always say our borders are very porous. People are just coming in from all angles, which is not security-wise is not good. So therefore, there should be a system where we know when they are entering, which bringing them, where are they going, when are they going to be in the country. All these ideas are good. And then the last layer is there should be a land availability for the cattle farm. Because most often cattle are not, the land are not owned by the government, they are owned by the traditional heads who are also being very, very exploitative. They will collect certain things undocumented. They will do all sorts of things, but then when there's a problem, they will tell them that they don't know. So these are some of the issues that we want the policy makers to look at it and then come up with a very good policy. So that because Ghana, when we look at the cattle, I was discussing, I Dr. to Alaska, we are discussing about how do we export the organic meat that we are having. Now there's a high demand for organic meat outside. So we are looking at how, what we do to process those meat to tally with the, with the American market so that in, on hiding wise and all those things so that we can export this thing out. 
I have a company called Cattle Innovation. The, the executive director is an American, Anna Marie, because she is into organic, organic selling organic seeds and meats. So we are looking at all those things so that we can use it to reduce the conflict and then bring modernization into this cattle. Because one thing I know, there's a lot of opportunities in rearing the cattle, be it the meat supply, the milk, and other things. So I'm sure when we look at all these things, there's going to be a win-win. The cattle, the, the crop farmers need the cattle, and then the, the cattle farmers also need the crop. So they should something like this, something like a co-existent between them. Okay. All right, Chief, thanks very much. I want to thank all our panelists today. Um, Steve, Gordana, Steve, Ian, and to all our attendees, you have really kept up with us up to this time. We've overshot our time by seven minutes. And we thank all those who post questions on uh, our platform because then thank this you. helps us to move forward. Um, and uh, some idea come up, and I'm sure we were yeah. beginning to touch on the, on the political yeah. economy part. And I think this is something that we should pick up more um, on, on exactly why we why most of our policies on personalism mm. are not working. Yeah. More because of the political angle that Chief talked about, that Ian intimated on. And then, of course, we you, you ended up very well by uh, talking about how we can also link up the global situation. We, we certainly have, um, I mean, we can have a niche market, right? We, we often talk about niche market, special products, organic meat, lean meat, and what have you. And of course, we are part of the global community. We have to adopt certain global strategies to also help us um, solve the problems that we have at hand. I want to thank everyone, and I want to thank Imogen and others for inviting me to chair today's function. Um, I'll hand over to um, Imogen, would you, any, you know, last, um, last words? Um, or yes. Rachel? Um, as one of the organizers, I'd just like to th say thank you very much to all panelists and attendees and to remind you all to keep uh, in touch with the Ghana Hub, which is a collaboration between IDS, UDS and University of Ghana at the moment. Um, you can uh, find our web page on the, in, the, in the chat, um, linked to you from the web page for this webinar, and we'll be following up on these issues and others of interest to Ghana and other West African countries. So thank you all very much, everybody, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you, and goodbye. Goodbye, all. <laughs>